In this video, I'm going to share what I learned from 100 years of city building. I've always wanted to sit down with city's skylines, but there's just so much content, I was honestly a bit intimidated. There's an overwhelming amount of information to consume if you want to be any good at this game. So I decided to forget that altogether and just be authentically not good. Ditch the strategy guides, and just use the method of guess and test. Try out an urban design that you think will work. If it doesn't, then scrap it and move on. Keep repeating this with every neighborhood, highway, and disaster you encounter until you have a majestic and great city. Welcome to Westfield. June 17th, 2022. Population zero. An empty highway exit, a building permit, and the starting money. $70,000. Or city dollars. Every time you play Cities Skylines, you're really building two cities, not one. The second one is your ideal city, the one you truly want to make. But the first one you build is not pretty. It's designed to make money and get people into the city, and unlock all of the inaccessible buildings and infrastructure at a low level of population. Kind of like a trick that the game designers are playing on you to make you mess up before you get to do what you really want to do. Using the limited tools available, I paved roads that made a beeline for the nearest body of water, a river running from the east to the south border of town. We'll need this river in a moment, but first the task is one, build a power plant, cheap, effective coal from the edge of town, two, pump clean water from upriver, and three, dump waste downriver, where it just disappears. We'll just link those together, run a few power poles, and voila! An urban backbone. Now that we've bounded everything, let's color it in with some zoning. This part's easy, just put industry near the edge of town by the power plant, then put residential zones far, far away, as far as possible, and add commercial zones between as a buffer to pollution. Done. Now, what I'm testing out here in year one is my default hypothesis that grids, the most naive approach, make for the best cities. After all, I mean, grids make good sense. Reliable, strong squares, sensible if a bit boring, they're probably the most common shape that smooth-brained civil engineers select in civil planning. But how big should the squares be? If we make the squares too small, we'll pay too much for maintenance. So I settled on this size of square. Pretty good, both for traffic and for fitting many houses. I laid out the grid foundation and hit Pop 900, a worthy village endowed with copious new opportunities at expansion. The grid grew, so I started setting out services, like fire departments, recycling centers, and schools to keep our people happy and less stupid. Unfortunately, an earthquake erupted just yards away, narrowly missing our grid on the fault line. Tiny Town, our next achievement at a pop of 1400. Still n not impressive at all, uh, though. But here's the real rub with the grid. It's sensible, it's dense, it's unfortunately very boring, but it also separates the pollution from the greenery pretty well. I expanded the grid and built a cemetery to hold the dead, many of whom had perished from the unfortunately deadly air pollution. Remember how I said before that every time you build a city in cities, skylines, you build two cities? I lied, you actually build many more than two cities, but each time you change something and try to improve on the old formula. Now that I had unlocked new and improved road designs like the three-lane highway, I was no longer limited to the stupid formula of just making everything a two-lane road. So I extended the highway exit to accommodate the final part of my grid, An another grid. But this time, I used the highway itself to separate all the residential and commercial zones from the industrial areas. You know how this works. Make the donuts on the industrial side of the town, then ship them into the mouths of the people living across the highway. It was almost perfect, save for some traffic backing up. This always catalyzes a change. To fix the traffic, I tore down and reformatted the exit into a clover leaf. Naturally, after building these grids for so long, one wonders, is there another way? So we entered phase two of the experiment, circles. In phase one, I had confirmed what I already knew. Squares are boring, but they do work. They have a few little problems like build up in popular parts of town. Circles are everything that squares aren't. They're like, like the yin to a square's yang. 
infinite sides, impossible to draw, but ultimately way better looking than squares. I zoned commercial zones and offices near the center, and apartment buildings along the outside. Four quarters, carved out neatly by another clover leaf intersection. I personally like building circles and curved infrastructure in city skylines because it looks beautiful and it makes me feel smarter. You know, in retrospect, this circle formation was highly inefficient. You have to cross a six lane highway anytime you leave the house. But it looks so good that it helps you ignore the fact that each interior circle is virtually isolated from the others, causing manifold traffic snafus. So I linked the two cities, circle and square, and decided that ultimately, the square city, though more boring than its circular counterpart, was ultimately the superior choice of urban design. Naturally, the next shape in my experiment was the triangle. The simplest of shapes, you can't possibly make a shape with two sides. Though I was pessimistic about its structural utility. Fun fact, if you build a city of triangles, you're also building one of hexagons for the price of one. Unfortunately, it also leads to bizarre hexagonal six-way intersections. Yuck. I decided to make Triangle Town an entirely industrial segment. Our pop had just hit a big city of 17,000, and we were starting to buckle under our own size. Supply chain issues were beginning to rear their ugly heads. Triangle Town was in a constant traffic gridlock, totally unsalvageable. But at least I had tried. The thought occurred to me, what if I was overcomplicating things? Just one big zigzag for the next neighborhood. Strangely, this does start to resemble the Hollywood Hills, a neighborhood designed to keep you out unless you have wheels. Then there was a tsunami. Westfield was now wetfield at the suggestion of my Twitch audience. The tsunami was Noahic, biblical and sublime like the judgment of Providence. Almost no one survived as the population dropped. Then Wetfield's coffers dried up, and it wasn't long before we were hopelessly opening loans to stay afloat. But when things look grim, you can always just declare bankruptcy in America. So we buried the power lines, built a huge canal and a seawall, and went much, much deeper into the red. Proudly bankrupt. Then there was a fire. Then there was a sinkhole. Then there was a thunderstorm. Then there was a tornado. But after only another 25 years of waiting, we returned to positive cash flows, acquired more land, and became a capital city. We wouldn't be trifled with, not even by a tsunami. Maybe the zigzag thing was tangential, but not as tangential as this actual tangent. <laughs> yeah, that one didn't work either. Okay, now time for a new serious experiment, roundabouts. The roundabouts were the best of both worlds, round and square at the same time. Honestly, I'm not sure how they do it, but they might be the perfect solution to traffic, which was virtually non-existent inside the district. High quality of life, attractive surroundings, demand sewered. We became a colossal city with another tsunami. The seawall did nothing, like a sand castle in front of a large wave. What was I doing wrong? Everyone died again. I raised the entire waterfront hundreds of feet higher to combat the anger of the sea. And I began dumping doo-doo into the ocean in hopes to reverse the tide against the most probable third tsunami. At least shielding myself with a large plateau of feces would give me peace of mind. To complete my final experiments with urban design, a neighborhood shaped like a star, a big spiral, and the Serpinski Gasket. You know, at least the city was finally making money again and back in the green. But if you want my honest opinion, I don't think any of these were very good city designs. Maybe the roundabouts. They have that je ne sais quoi. Curvilinear and yet still rectilinear, permitting the smooth flow of traffic. Grids are fine, but I stand by it. They're boring. Rhombuses look cool, but they offer little value beyond that of the squares. In the end, I got a city full of dead people, crime, and garbage. I resorted to helicopter police, and if we ever get the grant, I will be the first in line to pursue helicopter-based garbage collection services. But you know, I scratched the itch, and ultimately, maybe some of these ideas will pop into future cities. But some of them were just better off in the dank recesses of my imagination. Anyway, here's the third tsunami. I definitely recommend building on higher ground next time. I'm Ambiguous Amphibian. A big thanks to my patrons 
who are the first in line for disaster evacuation shelters when the next tsunami strikes. Until next time.